Welcome to Arts in the City. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson, and we're here at the New York Historical Society on the Upper West Side. Our first story begins in this very museum. To many, New York is the center of the universe, especially when it comes to superheroes. Tina Beth Pina has more. The New York Historical Society's Superheroes in Gotham exhibit celebrates six well-known champions of justice and the city they protect. New York, it's that sort of place where so many people come to reinvent themselves and it, you know, if you think about Superman flying up to the top of the building, it has to be in a city with skyscrapers and New York's the perfect place for that. New York is also the birthplace of several superheroes. Spider-Man is from Queens, Captain America is from the Lower East Side, while Iron Man hails from Long Island. The exhibit also explores the New York background of many comic book creators as well. Most of the superhero creators were from New York, and most of them were the sons of immigrants, primarily Jewish immigrants. A few of them went to DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx. Stan Lee went there, um, co-creator of Spider-Man and Incredible Hulk. And so did Bob Kane, who's the creator of Batman. Several of those young Jewish creators behind the crime fighters' capes changed their names, hoping to assimilate in America and appeal to wider audiences. Comic book legends Robert Kahn, Jacob Kurtzberg, and Stanley Lieber later became known as Bob Kane, Jack Kirby, and Stan Lee. I think that all immigrants, you know, want to reinvent themselves in one way or another because they've come here for opportunities and that often involves reinventing yourself. So I think the idea of starting again or having a new life um, really resonates um, and you can feel that in the characters of the superheroes, you know, the whole alter ego thing. And you, yes, you become bigger than yourself. Diana Prince, Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent's evolution are on display in the exhibit as are rare comic book memorabilia, audio and video clips, interactive kiosks, and a whole lot more. When you first walk in, the building is the Batmobile, which is really cool. We also have a lot of original art, um, including Steve Ditko's drawings, the very first drawings of Spider-Man ever done in um, the early 60s. Costumes, uh, we have Superman's costume from the TV show in the 50s and Spider-Man costume from the Broadway musical. We're looking at props from the Batman 66 TV show, the Gotham City Directory, the phone, Penguin's umbrella, um, and the bat inhalator. You get a sense of all the details that go into creating a television show and the way that the evolution of media technology just sort of nicely paralleled with the, um, the history and evolution of superheroes. There's also an exhibit that showcases the stories behind more recently developed New York City superheroes. In the 1980s, we have um, representation because Daryl McDaniels, who's one of the three founding members of the hip-hop group Run DMC, last year he started a company called Daryl Makes Comics, and the character is named DMC. It takes place in the 1980s in New York City. We also feature an artist, um, Dean Haspiel, and um, he did something a few years ago called um, the Red Hook, and it's a superhero who lives in Red Hook, Brooklyn. And with his work, we look at the, um, the popularity of digital formats, and what we have for visitors is an iPad with one of his stories, and um, it begins in the blackout of 2003, and the person who's Dean, who's, who's doing the drawing. He flashes back to 2001, 9-11. Reflecting on what's going on in the world is what makes new champions of justice, along with our old favorites, as relevant and as enjoyable as ever. I'm a big superhero fan. I love the Marvel series. I love the direction of this series. And this is so great. I had no idea that there was anything like this. Channeling the superhero in all of us, I'm Tina Beth Pina for Arts in the City. I'm Pat Collins in the Theater District, a popular destination for the holidays. Here on 45th Street, Hal Pacino stars in China Doll, Cecily Tyson and James Earl Jones reunite on stage in The Gin Game, and The Lion King is at the Minskoff. Broadway offers a variety of choices this season. Get on your feet. The Miami Sound Machine conquers Broadway with On Your Feet. The musical recreates Gloria and Amelia Estefan's rise to the top of the charts in the 1980s. Yeah. You're in 
Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote the music for School of Rock, an adaptation of the 2003 Jack Black movie. Mama, who bore me, Mama, the angel. The revival of Spring Awakening features a remarkable cast of deaf and hearing actors. Tony winner Kelly O'Hara and Hoon Lee dance into 2016 at a New Year's Eve performance of The King and I. The American in Paris cast jumps into 2016 with an 8 o'clock show on January 1st. A revival of The Color Purple stars Oscar and Grammy winner Jennifer Hudson and Cynthia Erivo, who plays Celie. Bruce Willis stars in Misery, based on Stephen King's bestseller. Laurie Metcalf wields the sledgehammer. I am your number one fan, I sure am. Tickets to two exceptional London imports, A View from the Bridge, and King Charles III should be on every theatergoer's wish list. God save the king! Oh, what a night! Jersey Boys, celebrating its 10th anniversary on Broadway, performs on Christmas night and January 1st. So does the family-friendly Finding Neverland with Matthew Morrison. The Illusionists, who have magically reappeared on Broadway, perform three shows on December 30th. Those Renaissance rascals of something rotten make merry at the St. James Theater. What do theater goers want from Santa? Tickets to the phenomenal hit Hamilton. It's your last chance to see A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. The 2014 Tony winning musical closes January 13th. I'm Pat Collins for Arts in the City. A retrospective on Chinese artist Zhang Hong Chu at the Queen's Museum has the power to shift the ways in which we see the world. Ernabel DeMillo reports. What I really care about is communicate between different cultures. The dialogue between different cultures, that's what I really con consider. Zhang Hongtu was born in 1943 to a Muslim family in China just when Mao Zedong rose to power. His dad was considered an enemy of the people. That made me, you know, very upset when I recall my life in China because I also want to be an artist, even when I was very, very young. Cultural revolution is very romantic. You now, uh, at my age, in the early 20, middle 20 something, of course they want to new culture. But once so people died, especially young people, that's changed my idea about culture revolution. It's not about culture, it's all about Chairman Mao's power. You have no voice. Even people listen to you, you will become in a very, very dangerous situation. By 1982, he comes to America and turns a critical eye towards China's political landscape. At the beginning of this, my new life in, in America, I thought I could forget everything happened in, in, in China. That, that was my nightmare. But another fundamental change to my life is the Tiananmen massacre. In, it happened in 1989. The reason they died because the government doesn't like them to express themselves. So usually, artists to express yourself become a big issue to me. He starts expressing himself by creating a whole series of Mao artwork where he dares to combine images of the leader with styles of Western artists like Andy Warhol, Marcel Duchamp, and Pablo Picasso. During the process of doing that, this one, I feel, I feel sin, I feel guilty because that's Chairman Mao. You used to see there is, you used to knife carded. This can be put in jail in China, but. Uh, I ask myself, why I'm here in America? Mao already died a couple of years, years. I still had this kind of bad feeling. So this, kind of, this is actually kind of like a psychological problem. And later I learned, not only me, 
a lot of, lot of Chinese people. So that made me just want to, to do more, to release myself from this kind of fear. Art becomes therapy for him, and his series becomes globally recognized as American fashion designer Vivian Tam transforms his art into high fashion. His controversial work continues with the banquet. I used uh, now, uh, Da Vinci's Last Supper, uh, but I replaced uh, all the religious images with uh, our mouth. From the Bible, uh, Jesus said, one few betrayed me. From my idea, who betrayed the mouth? Mao himself. This painting was to be exhibited at the nation's capital on the one-year anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre, but it was barred by Senator Ted Kennedy, who called it sacrilegious. But the first reject from American government power, that's made me kind of crazy, and I thought, no, it's not fair. Other artists also withdrew in support. It kicked up a storm in the Chinese and English press, but Zhuang didn't feel betrayed by America. I still can continue my work. And, uh, and also, <clears throat> right after the censorship, this painting got more publicity. So in this case, I don't blame America. After a few years, uh, continued my work, I told myself, OK, that's, that's enough. I don't feel anything uh, about Mao. Psychologically, I have no more problem. I stopped. I'm kind of more interested in um, the relationship between cultures, between the different society. So, especially from my life experience. You see this with his landscape series, which combines traditional Chinese landscape paintings with Western Impressionists, Monet, Cezanne, and Van Gogh, which were banned in Maoist China. We see this painting, and we can exchange our ideas. I say, oh, you see the, th the line, the color of the Impressionism. I see the line and the structure of the Chinese landscape that we say, what, what's, why this painting has uh, so much multi-faces? And then we will create something dialogue. Zhuang's more recent work addresses global issues, specifically water pollution. Zhuang paints his own version of Mao Yan's famous water paintings, a Chinese artist from the Song Dynasty. But in this case, the beauty from the colors come from the pollution in the environment. The main attraction of the Zhuang Hongtu retrospective is its enormous computer-generated rendition of China's impenetrable Great Wall. But this time, he has created gates to walk through. One word I can start my talk, I hate war. Uh, to me, the war only the function divide people. Uh, after I moved to Queens, I know my neighbor from everywhere in the world. I know people speak all different languages. So I like people look at my work, look at this piece. Think about the sharing, the communication, the dialogue between different people from different culture, different background. I like people think this way. I think that's really a dream about. This is Ernabel DeMillo for Arts in the City. What's it like growing up with the most iconic and controversial comedian of his generation? Kelly Carlin should know. She's just written a memoir about her boundary-breaking dad, George Carlin. Our Barry Mitchell spoke with the author herself. The part I really don't understand, if you're looking for self-help, why would you read a book written by somebody else? <laughs> that's not self-help, that's help. I was a great memory of being like high school age, maybe junior high, and dad and I going to the supermarket, and we start talking gibberish to each other in the produce section, and then we have like a fake fight in gibberish, basically, and people are like looking at us like we're crazy. It was you, your mom, Brenda, and your dad. Yeah. A lot of love. Mm -hmm. You also said at a very early age you were the family addict whisperer. I was able, as most kids who have uh, parents who are experimenting with chemicals, will say, you get to know how to read a room. What mood are they in? Maybe what have they taken? Are they arguing or not? And then knowing how to kind of act in order to keep things cool and level-headed. What's happening, baby? Gay pasta. 
Oh, sleety hippy dippy weatherman, with all the hippy dippy weatherman. Even when your dad was doing middle of the road stuff back in the early days, I did, and I used to watch that, I detected. There's a little bit of subversion going oh, on there. Oh, yes. Al Sleep, the hippy-dippy weatherman. People didn't know that the this man, man was stoned. stoned. <laughs> this is a Canadian low, which is not to be confused with a Mexican high. Eh? <laughs> you said, just as America was falling in love with George Carlin, George Carlin was falling out of love with America. What do you mean? Well, that, I mean, this was the late 60s, and our house was a counterculture house. Right when he was like at the peak of his career, when he was making $12,000 a week opening for the Supremes in Las Vegas, he was done. His soul was dying and he couldn't do it anymore. And he decided to give, up, give all of that up to be who he really wanted to be. Your favorite routine of your dad's after the transformation? The planet is fine from Jammin' in New York. Hundreds of thousands of years of bombardment by comets and asteroids and meteors, worldwide floods, tidal waves, worldwide fires, erosion, cosmic rays, recurring ice ages, and we think some plastic bags <laughs> and some aluminum cans are going to make a difference. Talk about your one woman show. Your dad was not happy when you talked about your family. Yeah, he was a little upset by it. My dad was at Dodger Stadium for a Mets game. He had a massive heart attack. But due to a crafty limo driver and the fact that St. John's Hospital just happened to be using a experimental anticoagulant that day, my dad got very, very lucky. He said to me, look, I can't come and be in the audience. It's too much for me personally but I completely respect you as an artist and you need to do what you need to do. And were you happy to hear him say, I respect you as an artist? Yeah, it was amazing. It's an amazing moment, absolutely. You earned a master's degree in counseling psychology. Mm -hmm. You were a therapist mm -hmm. and you're a life coach. Generally what it is, it's about helping people un uh, take their strengths that are, may, may even be hidden to themselves and, and, and helping them use those strengths in order to reach the places they want to reach in their life. It's mm -hmm. that simple. And a coach can help people find the real essence of who they are wow. and move forward. Wow. It's fun stuff. It's, I love it because I love watching people go for their dreams and get their dreams. Can I get on your calendar? Yes. Because I totally <laughs> need that. A Carlin home companion growing up with George. A candid look at showbiz, family, life, love, and all that stuff. <laughs> Kelly Carlin, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. And you're watching Arts in the City. In the world of sports, athletes go to great lengths to express their individuality. Basketball players curate their outfits for that post-game press conference. Football players have a signature celebratory touchdown dance. But in the world of hockey, art plays a role. Andrew Falzone found out how. When goalie masks first showed up in the NHL, they were originally intended to protect the goaltender's face. But since the mask has evolved, so too has the decoration and the art surrounding it. Mask painting's a really superstitious kind of thing with goalies. Goalies are nuts, nut jobs anyway. I, I'm a goalie. Maybe the reason Ryan Smith is so good at painting goalie masks is because he understands the position and the athletes who play it. Ice hockey might be considered a Canadian affair, so Ryan's shop is located in a rather unexpected location. When the dining room table got too crowded, he moved his studio to this unassuming tool shed in his backyard in Montclair, New Jersey. Being here in North Jersey, um, there was no mask painter around here that people could rely on to, to give them the quality that they see on TV. And I kind of wanted to give the goalies around here a, a mask painter that could give that to them. Ryan's company, Royal Essex, also airbrushes motorcycle helmets, and word has spread quickly about his work. He shipped his custom creations to goalies in Canada, Europe, and even as far away as Australia. I have Devils fans in, in California, which is the airbrush capital of the world, sending me a uh, mask because they want like a New Jersey guy to do the Devils mask, so it's pretty cool. As he was learning the painting process, Ryan idolized the work of another mask painter who happens to be a New Jersey resident as well. Ed Carberly not only designed the infamous Hannibal Lecter mask, but starting in 1988, painted 12 seasons of NHL goalie masks and still maintains an art studio in Frenchtown, New Jersey. He's a uh, mask, he actually makes the mold, the masks himself. 
Tom Barrasso, Mike Richter, all those iconic masks. That's Ed Coverley. So I actually got to meet him. I grew up looking at all his masks and and saying, all right, I want to get I want to get that kind of style. Coverley was the artist behind the iconic Statue of Liberty mask worn by New York Ranger goalie Mike Richter and revered by Ranger fans. He was also the artist behind Martin Brodeur's rookie year mask, currently in net for the Devils or the duo of backup Keith Kincaid and starter Corey Schneider. I think the helmet is the ultimate kind of canvas where you can display any anything you hold close to you or you believe in or you think is funny or, or unique or cool. And there aren't many ways in this game that you can kind of be unique and an individual because it is the ultimate team sport. But being pretty is not a mask's primary purpose. Hope my uh, my glove hand would be quicker than my face would, uh, but uh, it'll give you a little ringing sensation. But the way they make the mask now, you know, they're pretty protective. You still feel them when you take them, but. Uh, you know, compared to back when they didn't wear masks or they wore those, you know, thin pieces of plastic that you'd still still get hurt. So uh, the technology and the safety of these things is unbelievable in there. None of Ryan's masks have made it to the NHL yet, but one of his clients is well on his way. Ryan painted these masks for Matt Morris, a Ridgewood, New Jersey native, who's the starting goalie for the University of Maine Black Bears and NCAA Division I school. I really enjoy painting his masks because he's so open everything and I can really express myself and he's cool with whatever designs you know I throw at him. After brainstorming with a client the designs are etched onto vinyl. Each graphic element is carefully peeled away with a razor blade. The outer mask is totally stripped down and lightly sanded in preparation for a base coat. This is my clear coat booth in there so this is where I clear coat the helmets. This is where I do um, a lot of the big spraying, like when I do my base coats or anything like that. Um, all gets done in there. In addition to the NHL, Ryan wants to see his work displayed in one more venue, well known to a younger generation of hockey fans. I want to see my mask on NHL EA Sports video game. And so ever since I was a kid, I thought I thought that was really cool. But for now, Ryan will have to settle for his masks making their mark in the real world as functional art in the coolest game on earth. I'm Andrew Falzone for Arts in the City. Is holiday shopping getting to you? Is that end of year to-do list stressing you out? Here's an idea for adults to decompress. Try coloring. Carol Ann Riddell explains. Step inside book culture on the Upper West Side and you'll see it. A full display of coloring books for grown-ups. If you're thinking to yourself, hold on, isn't coloring for kids? Think again. Adult coloring books are huge right now. Rachel Westerwell is the manager here at Book Culture and she's watched the trend pick up speed. We know Fridays that we need to have our display fully stocked because come Sunday evening, it's been decimated. What do people tell you about why they're buying them? They buy them because it just gives them a chance to forget about things for a little bit and just relax and create. So who's coloring? Lots of people, like our colleague Jai Wang, who likes her pencils sharp and her pictures detailed. How long is the longest you would spend coloring? Six, seven hours. Six, like seven that. hours. Yeah. In one stretch. Yeah, in one stretch. <laughs> wow. It's hard to stop. Adult coloring books are very different from the kitty versions. Many of the designs are sophisticated and intensely intricate. No jumbo crayons here. But can they actually be therapeutic? We put the question to art therapist Drina Fagan. Do you think these coloring books can be helpful to people? Totally, yeah. 100%. Fagan says that doesn't mean the books themselves qualify as art therapy. That requires an actual therapist working with another person. Still, she believes coloring can be valuable. For example, in helping busy adults to slow down, turn off, and tune out. It's a gratifying excursion back to childhood to a certain extent, right? Like it's a very um, appealing way to comfort yourself. There's so many things we can't control in our daily lives and so if you can sit down and you can control your pencil and you can keep it in the lines and and then when it's done you kind of like how it turned out. The, even just that moment of satisfaction feels like it's worth grabbing. 
Sounds good to me, so I decided to give it a try. I mean, who doesn't have stress they want to relieve? We gathered some coloring books and sat down at my kitchen counter with adults and kids, including a few of my own. One end of our table was very focused on pencil sharpening and candy eating. I did add five cookie rolls. You've had like six. No, I haven't. Followed by more candy eating. Candy wrapper, candy wrapper, half-eaten half Tootsie Roll. Ooh. Actually, that was used to color. And turns out we had quite an opinionated bunch. I'd love to get your feedback, guys, on what you think of my dragonfly. Bad. I thought it was a butterfly. Bad? Did you say bad? Orange could have more. What happened over here? You like merged into orange, it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, you know, I thought it was sort of creative. No? That's that's one word you could use to describe it. I get in theory how this coloring could be pretty relaxing, but maybe what I need is a few less critics. I'm just trying to help. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Arts in the City. This month's Hidden Gem of New York takes us to the Upper East Side, where a building that symbolizes the city has been renewed. Almost two years after closing for renovations, the home of New York City's mayor has reopened to the public with a brand new art exhibition to boot. Gracie Mansion has been located in Yorkville's Carl Shores Park since 1799. Shipping mogul Archibald Gracie originally constructed the building to serve as his country residence. After changing owners several times over the next century, the mansion was seized by the city and given to the park. In 1941, Commissioner Robert Moses persuaded the city to turn the house into the official home of the mayor, and Fiorella LaGuardia became its first in-office tenant the following year. The mansion's ground floor contains a new exhibition titled Windows on the City. Artwork, furniture, and objects tell the story of New Yorkers who lived when the house was originally built in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. It features works that have been donated from the collections of the Museum of the City of New York, the New York Historical Society, and the Brooklyn Museum, among others. On one wall hangs a document rallying Irishmen to fight against their own unfair treatment, while next to it is a ketubah, a sacred Jewish prenuptial agreement from 1800. In that same room, encased in glass, is a peace tomahawk donated by the National Museum of the American Indian. And this 1820 painting of downtown Brooklyn by Louisa Ann Coleman, one of New York's leading female artists of her era. Gracie Mansion is now open for public tours, and you can reserve a ticket on the nyc.gov website. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories or to watch them at any time, go to the link below. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson, and thank you for watching Arts in the City.